Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Introduction to Psychology. I'm going to pick up the lecture on sensation and perception today with the visual system. So there is a very wide range of electromagnetic waves, and we only see a portion of it as the, the visual spectrum. And there are some waves that, that are so big that the, they're as, as tall as buildings, okay? Those are like radio waves. And then, you know, there are shorter ones like, like microwaves. When you heat your food, you know that your food is getting hot in the microwave, but you don't see it being bombarded with light to heat it, which is what's actually happening. And then shorter than that, you have um, infrared waves and uh, remote control devices uh, use infrared light that you can't see. So I'm turning this uh, remote control on and off, or I'm pushing buttons on it, and it's emitting light, but I can't see this, right? You can't see that with your remote control. But the um, camera on my computer actually can pick up infrared light, and I'll turn it, convert it to light um, in the visible spectrum, so you will be able to see this. See how I'm pushing a button on, a, on the remote control? You can see light, kind of like a flashlight. I can't see that. It's infrared. The light that we can see runs from wave. I sorry, I just saw saw a chat that someone can't hear me, but sometimes that just means someone has their speakers off. So, do I need to do a sound test? Okay, I'll keep going and I'll stop if I see any more chats about not being able to hear me. So the light that we can see runs from uh, about 400 to 700 uh, nanometers in, in wavelength. And the shortest is the highest frequency, shortest wavelengths is, is violet. And the longest ones are, are the red waves at around 700. But then there's wavelengths that, that are even shorter than that, right? like ultraviolet light and x-rays and, and gamma rays. Other animals see different ranges of wavelengths. There are some people who can see UV light if they've, um, especially if they've had surgery on their eye that removes the lens. Claude Monet was one of those people and his uh, later paintings are like very sort of washed out blues and, and whites. Quite beautiful to look at, but uh, they might indicate that he was seeing UV light. This is the way um, that a bee might see or visualizing what they might see. Obviously, we can't see what they see because we don't have um, the ability to do so. But this is something like what things might look like to a bee. And now someone has their microphone on and let me go. Oh, see. sorry. Okay. I'll turn it off. Thank you. So flowers contain markings that are visible to insects like bees that can, can see ultraviolet light. I think birds might be able to as well, I'm not sure, uh, but it directs them to find the nectar. The, the positionality of, of the eyes on, on the face says something too. You can see different animals here and you can see that some of them have eyes that are kind of both facing forward and some of them have eyes facing to the side. Why, why might that be? Is there anything that the animals who have side facing eyes, is there anything about them that distinguishes them from the animals that have front facing eyes? Yes, and I just, I didn't realize that my chat went away. Um, but yes, you guys are right. It's, uh, it's it, for, for prey animals to be able to, to see around them, right? So they need to have um, a wide view of the world so that they can see the, you know, cats and foxes coming for them. But predators 
need to be able to focus on their target, right? And go for it. And our eyes, um, we have a sense of depth perception that comes from the fact that our brains compute one image out of, out of our two visual fields that are slightly different. And that gives you a sense of, of how far away something is. And that's super important for a predator. But, you know, rodents don't do that, okay? Their eyes actually move independently from each other. They see two separate pictures. And they interpret that when they're navigating in their environment. And they're very good at, you know, dodging stuff. Brightness and hue and saturation are concepts that we'll talk about now so brightness is about the amount of light that's being reflected back from an object into the eye okay? it's about the en intensity of the energy output and we'd measure that as um, as amplitude okay? height of the wave color is about wavelength, okay? And that means the, the length from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next wave. And uh, the longer wavelengths start with, uh, with red, and then they get shorter and shorter and shorter, and they're, the shortest wavelengths we can see are violet. The color of the light is specified by the dominant wavelength in an intensity distribution curve. So this wavelength of light here is a little bit messy. It's not as clean as these ones, okay? And But we could see that it peaks around, I don't know, 515 uh, nanometers. So the hue of that light is going to be some kind of green. But it'll be a bit of a muddy color because it's also picking up other wavelengths. Saturation is about the purity of the color. So this would not be a highly saturated color. It'd be a bit muddy, a bit gray. Okay, so saturation is about kind of the, the slope of the wave, but it's really about how most of the energy is distributed around one wavelength. So saturated colors appear pure instead of like grayish or washed out, okay? And because all the, the intensity of the wave is close to the dominant wavelength instead of more spread out over other wavelengths, which would serve to wash out the hue. White light consists of all wavelengths with um, no dominant one, okay? is that's white light is completely unsaturated. There's as much red light as orange light, as yellow light, as green light, as blue light, as purple light in, in white light. What about, never mind. Never mind. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say like, what about dark colors, but then you said light. So like, what would be the difference between like- So brightness is about the amount of light that is being reflected back from, into your eye from the object. A dark color like black is actually absorbing all the light and not reflecting it back at you. Brightness is the brightness is the amplitude of, of the wave as height. So it's darker means like less light. Mixing light and, and mixing paint isn't quite the same game. So if you were to mix all the colors of light, you would get white light. And you can see that the, the primary colors of light are blue, green, and red. And when you mix these, you get the secondary colors. So mixing red light and green light makes yellow light. Mixing blue and green makes cyan, which um, you might know as aqua or teal. And mixing blue and red light makes magenta. And you'll notice that these are the primary colors of, of paint. But when you get um, 
when you mix them, you get these secondary colors. So if you mix magenta and yellow, then you get red. Okay, mix cyan and yellow to get green. And if you were to mix up all the paint colors, you'd end up with something very dark. So that's the difference between additive color mixing and subtractive color mixing. In the textbook, you will find um, a diagram of the structure of the eye. And the way it works is the light first passes your cornea. The cells of your cornea are completely transparent. Uh, the cornea provides a like a protective outer layer to your eye, but it also helps bend and focus the light um, so that it can focus on the right place on your retina because it has a, a curved shape. But your pupil is actually a hole, and so you would want to have something covering that. Your eye is also full of aqueous humor and vitreous humor, which fills it out and gives it shape. So the um, iris is a muscle that can expand and contract to allow in more or less light. So when it's really bright outside, your pupils will get small, okay? And when it's dark, they'll, they'll get really big. Um, then the, the lens is a disc that can thicken or flatten to help focus light on, um, on your retina. And the place where you see with your greatest acuity, greatest clearness, is the fovea. And then there's layers of cells at the back of your eye that, com that goes through three different types of, um, of cells, at least three. There's probably even more than that. And the last ones are the ganglion cells. And the axons of the ganglion cells combine to form the optic nerve that uh, then goes to your brain. But your you cannot see if light is you know focused on on the part where those axons are leaving, right? That's called your blind spot. Now I'm seeing some chats about people not being able to hear. Um, I hope that this is being recorded. I'm going to check my settings quickly. Um, and now I'm seeing other chats that's, that that some students can hear and some students cannot hear. I'm crossing my fingers that this is being recorded. I do know when I go over the recordings that sometimes I find a dead space, right? And it doesn't pick it doesn't pick up any audio, and I don't know what that's about. But I'm glad to glad that most of you guys can hear. If you look at somebody's eyes, what you're seeing is, well, past the cornea, is the sclera. That's the white portion of the eyes. And you're seeing their iris. Those muscles are colored. And their pupil, which is the hole where the light enters the eye. And something that is, is worth knowing is that if somebody trusts you or they're attracted to you, their, their pupils will dilate. And if someone feels threatened by you, you might notice their, their pupils suddenly constricting and getting small. And I've, I found it useful to know that in, in interpersonal situations because it's an involuntary response. So when, when dealing with, uh, say, like conflict in the workplace, one of the things I noticed was somebody's eyes, uh, their pupils suddenly getting small. And then I think, oh, what I said just make them made them feel threatened. And then they'll say something and I, whatever they say, I might give equal weight to the fact that I just saw what happened to their pupils. And um, people can control what they say more than they can control involuntary responses like that. Um, I think we've already covered this, but um, the, the lens, the term for the changes in the curvature of the lens that make it flatter, right, or or thicker are called accommodation. And that accommodation serves to ideally focus the image onto the retina. But sometimes it can't do that. And one reason it might be able to do that is that your the eyeball is just too long in shape. 
and it falls falls forward. Okay, and then that's called nearsightedness. And then if the eyeball is too short, it might be throwing it too far. Okay. And that's what we call a farsighted eye. I'm a very nearsighted person. These are, this is a very strong prescription. But fortunately, we, we have lenses like this that we can look through in order to have the image focused on the right part of the retina so that we can see clearly. There are two kinds of photoreceptors for light. There are rods and there are cones. Rods are better for low light vision. You don't see as clearly with your rods and there are more of them in your peripheral vision. Okay. Um, the part of your retina where you see the most clearly is the fovea and that's where you're going to find more of the cones cones are more sensitive you see more clearly with your cones but they require a lot of light and they're responsible for your color vision and you have three types of cones there are cones that are most sensitive to short wavelengths you'll also hear those referred to as like the the red cones um there are cones that are most sensitive uh, to middle wavelengths, and those you might also hear called green cones. And then there's cones that are most sensitive to short wavelengths, and you might hear those called blue cones. I think that's a bit confusing because the cones actually are not red or green or blue. Okay? They're sensitive to um, shorter, medium, or longer wavelengths. And if you look at the intensity distribution curve for the for the red cones, it actually falls around yellow. So here's a game for you. How many black dots are there in that picture? Yeah, so I see, oh, I, I see quite a range. So Gautham says there are zero, but then several other students say that there's 12. Eighteen. I think 12 is, is coming up the most in the chat. And do you see all 12 of those at once? Is there anyone that can see all 12 at once? I've had one student who could see all 12 at once. But most of you, right, are not seeing all 12 at once. They're jumping around. And what's happening here is that when you, well, well first of all, there are 12. That is correct. And, and we can do that just by, let's say I'll, I'll again get my laser pointer. Oh, there's somebody who can see three at a time. I can see one and then pretty much the one I'm looking at head on. And then I could see like maybe another one in my peripheral vision. So I'm gonna turn my laser pointer on here and you can see there are 12, right? One, two, three, four in one row, another four in the second row and another four in the third row to me that gives me a headache. And um, I'm looking at the chat and you can see you have different visual abilities, right? Even in this classroom. So there's a student who can see four at a time, um, a square of four at a time, or a line of three at a time. And there's another student who can see about um, seven at a time. And um, that's because we, we have differences in our sensory abilities. And what's going on here is that when you look at when you look at it head on, that's being focused onto your fovea, and then, and then you can see that. But then you need your peripheral vision to see the other ones. And it's a very small dot. With, with the, the rest of the lines, your brain can fill that in. It know, knows what's going on. But the dot is small, and, and it's spaced kind of further away. And your peripheral vision is just not that sensitive. 
And so maybe you can see the one that's next to it on one side or the other side, but it's kind of probably coming in and out of being for you. Like it's there, the ones in your peripheral vision are like there and then they're not. So um, the things that you see actually kind of fade in and out, but your brain will construct a, a stable picture. But this is a kind of a, about a difference between your rods and cones. So to see all 12 dots at once, you have to use both your central and your peripheral vision. And you're seeing those dots and you're, you're seeing them, mo you'd be seeing most of them with the rods in your peripheral vision. And humans have pretty bad peripheral vision, okay? So if you focus on like, on a word in the center of a line of text, you'll probably see it clearly. But if you focused on that and you tried to read the words at either side without moving your eyes, they would look very, very blurry. And so as a result, the brain has to make its best guess about what's most likely going on in all that fuzzy periphery and fill in the mental image accordingly. So you have an impression that you see things clearly, but you, you really only see clearly what you're looking right at and your brain is filling in the rest. It's making a, an educated guess. And then there's a student who says uh, that she can see all of them at once when looking at it closer. And, and I'm going to try that. I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious. I have to try that. I see more when I do that. Yeah. So when I pulled my laptop right up to my face, I could see more than when it was further away. Very interesting. So that when... The image is, is picked up, it's, it's sent through layers of um, cells in your retina. It goes from the cones to the bipolar cells, from the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells, and the axons of the ganglion cells wind up into the optic nerve. And the fact that the part of your retina uh, is an exit point means that, that you can't see there. And so um, you, we all have a blind spot where we just can't see anything. And there's an experiment, there's, there's a figure in your text that you can use to see your blind spot. So it gives you, you know, um, an image like that and you pick up your textbook and let's pretend that my day planner is your textbook. And if you were to focus on the, the cross, the plus sign, okay, focus on that and then move the page away from you, the dot that's in your peripheral vision will just disappear at a certain point. And that's the point at which it would have been reflected onto your blind spot. So even though we always have this blind spot, we're just not aware of it because our brain fills in the rest of the picture. So most of the, the axons of that optic nerve go to the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus is like that switchboard. Um, and, and then to the visual cortex. But some of them go to your midbrain. And that makes sense to me because your midbrain is older than your forebrain. And, of course, your distant ancestors would have had... Uh, visual information going to their midbrain so they could make those uh, sort of primal decisions about primal behavior that the midbrain seems to control. There are different cells in your cortex that maximally respond to different kinds of, of stimuli. And this was discovered with research on cats who have very similar visual systems to humans. So there are cells that are called feature detector cells, and they detect lines and edges. Some of them are simple spell cells, and they detect like orientations of lines, like a like a horizontal line or a vertical line or one of you know this kind of slope in a particular location in your visual field, like a horizontal line right over there, right? Like, like on the door you see behind me. Um, and then there are complex cells that are also orientation specific, but they are less dependent on location in your visual field. 
Now, you've probably all heard the idea that grass is green. That's not quite accurate. The most accurate thing to say would be that grass reflects weight, light of a wavelength of about 550 nanometers. Because that wavelength of light isn't used to it, useful to it. That's garbage for photosynthesis. It says throws out that light, but but it wants to process the rest of it. Okay. Um, so what's real out there in the in the real world is that there's light waves that have different wavelengths. The the greenness of the grass is a matter of perception. It's that higher level processing in your brain, okay? Your brain creates green. And we have all kinds of poetic associations about green and looking at green might make you feel a certain way. Like we think the green looks uh, invigorating and, and refreshing. And you have different feelings about blue and red, but that's, that's in your head, okay? The, the greenness or the redness isn't out there in the object. So there's two major theories of, of color perception historically, and they turned out to be kind of both right in, in different ways. Trichromatic theory says that color vision is based on your sensitivity to three primary wavelengths, like short, medium, and long. This is the idea that you have, uh, you know, red cones, blue cones, and, and green cones. Obviously not about the color of the cone, but the, the wavelength that they are picking up. And you can see that what we're calling the, the red cone actually has its peak sensitivity to a kind of yellow. So calling it the red cone is a bit of a misnomer. Anyway, um, this explains color blindness because there's some folks that don't see certain colors because they might be missing a certain type of cone. The most common form of uh, color blindness is red green. We get all the different colors of light by mixing the three primary colors of light, which are red, green, and blue. And if you were to look up, look at your phone really, really close, really super close, you might see that the screen is actually made of pixels like this. And I'm a little older than you, so I can only see this when there's a drop of water on my phone, and then it really jumps out. I see these red, green, and blue pixels. This is what a, like a TV image looks like up close. And so you have the impression with distance that maybe this is part of, I'm not sure what this is, maybe it's part of someone's face, it looks kind of beige, but if you get really close, you can see it's it's all red, green, and blue pixels being lit up in different orders to create the other colors. This is the Ashara test for color blindness. If you have full color vision, you will be able to read the numbers. So I can see there's a number seven here. But if you have red, green color blindness, you won't be able to see that. And red, green color blindness is the most common form of color blindness. It has quite a high, well, I don't know if I'd call it high, but it's reasonably common among, especially among males. The second one is a 13. And we have a blue and orange 16 have a red eight on a green field. So somebody with red green color blindness wouldn't be able to see this. Next one is a 12. Okay, it's a green 12 on a red background. And we have a nine, that's an orange nine on a green and yellow background. So, and I have, see a comment in the chat saying this one can see seven, 13, 16, eight, 12, and nine is correct. You have full color vision. And then there's another question. What if the eight looked purple instead of red? Then somebody with red, green color blindness would probably be able to see it, but they wouldn't. I don't know if they'd see it. it color blindness doesn't just affect 
one or two colors. Like if someone has red green color blindness, it doesn't mean that they see all the other colors normally and they just can't see red and green. It affects the perception of other colors, but they might still be able to distinguish them. So if the eight was purple, they would maybe see that as blue because they don't have the, the red cone. Now, here's a phenomenon that is not explained by trichromatic color theory. We're going to need a different theory to expl explain what's about to happen. So let's look at the black dot in the middle of the maple leaf there. And we're going to look at it for a good 10 seconds. So I'm staring right at that black dot when two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And for this work, you need your head to be still staring at the black dot. Now I'm going to change, get rid of that, and we'll look at a white screen. Now blink, blink, blink. Okay. And as you're blinking, I'm going to see, what do you see? That worked very well for me. I got a strong effect. But they used to show this in, in psychology classes, and I'd be like, well, what's going on? It never worked for me. And I figured out the way to make it work was to blink, blink, blink. Yeah, so you see the maple leaf and you see it as red. How interesting. You were looking at something green and now it's coming up as red. And one student still seeing it with their eyes open. It's kind of kind of floats in front of you, right? Okay, here's another one. Stare at the black dot in the middle. What is happening here is there's a there's a ring of um, lilac of, of purple dots, okay? And one of them is disappearing, and then the next one disappears, and the next one disappears. That creates an illusion of movement that's called the phi phenomenon. And if you stare at the black dot, what happens? is that eventually the purple starts to fade out. The lilac dots start to fade away because they're lilac on a lilac background. And remember that things in your peripheral vision fade. But your your mind is certainly attuned to this, to motion, and, and there's a, an illusion of motion here. And what it'll start to look like is it's not the fact that the lilac is disappearing. You'll actually see something green. It looks like there is a green circle that is running around. You see that? Looks green. It's not. It's just a lilac dot disappearing. Kind of cool, eh? Here's another one. Guinness, this is a black and white image. And what I'm going to show you in the next slide is a negative version of the image. So there's a full color image of this model. There's a negative version that shows the like the opposite color. And there's a black and white version. So we're going to be looking, look at, stare at the X. I know it's hard. Now I'm going to show you the negative version. Okay. Keep staring at the X. And eh, staring at that X, maybe I'll give you another minute. So in the negative version, we look at the opposite color. So the black X went to being in uh, a white X. Orange goes to being blue. Okay, so the X. And now I'm going to go back to the black and white version. <laughs> Do you see that as full color, like the original color? You saw like a white person wearing a blue bathing suit. Yeah. So there is like a second where you see it in the original, you see her in, in original color. But this has just gone from black and white to negative to black and white. 
So what's going on here? Something's up that's not explained by this trichromatic theory about these three different kinds of cones. The cone's responses are processed by opponent process cells. Here's an example of an opponent process in my body. Okay? When I bring my arm in, this muscle is activated. And now when I send it out, a different muscle is activated. This one over here. Okay? This one's now working. That one's not. And now when I send it back out, this muscle is working. And this one's not. See how, see, so for me to move my arm like this, I can move, uh, I'm contracting one muscle or the other, but not both at the same time. So cones are linked together in opposing pair. And only one of the cones can create a signal for the brain at the same time. So you have three channels that they're sending, the cones are sending their information up in, and one of them's the red-green channel, one of them is the black-white channel, and one of them is the yellow and blue channel. So you see purple as a blend of red and blue because it activates both the red-green channel as the red channel and the blue-yellow channel as a blue channel. Some color information is lost in this process. Okay? And this explains why we can see some color combinations, but not others. So you can see yellowish green, chartreuse, but not reddish green. And that has to do with the way that color information is lost or suppressed at the channel level. Butterflies do not have that problem. They see more colors than we do. And Apparently, there's some women that can, can see more colors. I can't tell you what they are because I can't see them. So when you look at that, let's go back to, to the Canadian flag example, the green Canadian flag. When you're looking at that, your, your green receptor is, is activated and it's going green, 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 green. But remember, we talked about a really important process in human sensation and perception, and that's adaptation. So if I turn on a noisy fan, you're aware of it, and then you kind of stop hearing it. And that's because the sensory receptors that would be picking up on it kind of get bored, and they slow down with that message. But if I were to stop the fan, then you would... Um, you'd be aware of that. So we're aware of changes, but when we keep um, when we keep being exposed to a stimulus, the receptor kind of gets bored. So when you're staring at the green, like your green receptors are going green, 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 and you keep staring at it and they're like green, 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 green. And then when we take the stimulus away and you see white. Remember white is equal parts, all of those wavelengths. There's green in the white and there's red in the white, but your green uh, receptors are just kind of, they're kind of bored. They don't really care anymore. But the red ones are picking up the red. They're going red, 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 I see red. And that's why you're aware of seeing red when, when you're not. You're really looking at a white background that contains um, equal parts of, of all those wavelengths. So the, the red signal is stronger, it, it's much more sensitive, it's better at picking the red out of the white, and that overpowers the, the green, okay? So you see more red than is actually there. There's a question, can parrots see colors we're not even aware of? I don't know, but it's possible because um, different animals are sensitive to different wavelengths, and there are animals that can, can see ultraviolet lights, and, and birds might be included in those. I'm not sure. I definitely know that um, some bugs are. Context matters, right? There's a lot about, remember, colors about perception, and when you look at this image, which is showing a uh, white and gray checkerboard, your brain is probably telling you that this is white, square A, and that square B is gray. And that makes sense because of the order of the checkerboard. And that makes sense because there's a ball here that's casting a shadow over the A that you're kind of correcting for. Now, it's, it's still a white square. 
But if we were to compare these side by side, like if you crop them out of the image, this square is exactly the same shade as this one. They're the same shade of gray. But your brain is telling you that this one is white, and so you're seeing it as, as lighter. And, and of course, you're aware that this white is brighter than that. But you're interpreting this as, as white that's in the shadow of the ball. Actually, the exact same shade as, as B. We perceive objects as having a consistent color through different levels of illumination, okay? And, and the different levels of general illumination actually change can change the wavelength that's being reflected by the object, but we perceive it as having a constant color. So in, in this example here, all of those blue squares are actually the exact same, same blue, but because of changes in the illumination of the cube, this one's going to look kind of brighter to you. Because really, if, if in real life, if these all were the same blue, this would be much darker if it was um, part of this side of the cube that is in the shade. But it's not, right? And, that, and the fact that it's not makes it look like it's almost like a glowing kind of blue. In this example, we're seeing a cube, like a Rubik's cube, through a yellow filter, and then we're seeing it through a blue filter. And some of these squares are actually gray. But under the yellow filter, you're seeing these as blue, not gray. They're actually gray. The tops of them are gray, okay? when it's under the blue filter, you're seeing the same gray as yellow. And that is such a strong effect. I couldn't really believe it. I was like, no, something must be wrong. And I went in there with my snipping tool and I cropped them out. And you can see that it is in fact the case that the, the tops of the, of the cubes or the squares are in fact gray. It's the same shade of mid gray. In this case, um, these other squares here you're seeing as as red, they're they're actually orange, but that makes sense to your brain because under a yellow filter, red would look orange. And here they're actually purple, but under a blue filter, you'd expect the the that to come up as you'd expect it it to be red to come up as as purple. And there's a comment that from Sarah, I see purple in the first picture. Uh, where are you seeing the purple, Sarah? Are you seeing these as purple? I see them as like a royal blue, kind of like the blue in the blue filter here. Okay, so this is supposed to be blue. It comes off as blue to most people. Here, 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 and here but they're actually gray. Interesting. So it looks purple to you. I find that when I do these um, with a class, there's there's always some students that it just doesn't work on for one reason or another. And uh, I think that's because we have, you know, diversity in the way our eye is structured and the way that we perceive things, which is a good thing. Now, this is a famous, famous dress. What color is the dress? Red and white on, oh, that's a new one. <laughs> Blue and black. Some people are seeing this as white and gold, and some seeing some people are seeing this dress as blue and black. Whether you so our perception of color, it's a perception, remember, and it depends on context. And whether you see this dress as blue or black or um, white and gold depends on the assumptions that you're making about the background illumination, whether you are assuming you're seeing this in daylight or whether you're assuming that you're seeing this inside a, an, a shop, like in a mall. OK, 
Okay. So um, if you see this dress as blue and black, um, it's really hard for you to imagine that other people are actually seeing this as, as white and gold. And if you really see this as white and gold, it, it's hard to believe that other people are looking at blue and black because those are those are different colors. So let's let's explain that. So in in the next slide, I'm going to show you um, the flag of a tropical nation that produces a lot of pineapple and coconuts. Okay, it is a um, it, it's a, a golden and white striped flag. Okay, you're going to see horizontal golden white stripes. There you go. Can you believe that that's gold and white? Kind of, uh, it, it's in, in the blazing sun over here. The sun is shining right on it. And then the flag kind of dips into the shade over here. Are you guys seeing that as gold and white? Can your, your brain do that? Emily is on to the trick. All right. Shake that out. Okay. I'm just going to look at this, this black slide for a while. Let that go. Now, in, in the next slide, um, I'm going to be showing you a flag of another small um, island nation. And we're going to look at the flag and start by looking at the bottom color. And um, this this is in a wintry island. Its main exports are like cobalt, cobalt, deep blue sapphires, and and coal and coal, which they find in these cold, dark mines. Okay, it's a sapphire blue and black flag. There's a lot of light on it though, so it's going to look a little washed out. Okay, this is sort of a sapphire blue, and this is a washed out black. And then it gets really washed out in light. Can you see that as, as blue and black? Tell your brain that the whole flag is blue and black. Okay, now I'm, I'm really getting, I'm really getting blue and black now when I sit back, okay. I'm reading these lines as like jet black now. Right now, I'm perceiving these lines as as black as the Microsoft Teams black. And I'm getting a fully, I'm starting to buy, this is starting to work for me. Okay, this is all blue and black for me. Now this is kind of a, a washed out blue and black. And that's that's super washed out. That's like newspaper in the sun. Yes, it is. It's the same flag for it, but I'm trying to, help you coach you into tricking your brain into seeing the same thing as either blue and black or white and gold to explain the dress phenomenon. I don't know if that worked. Okay, so someone was able to change their way of thinking about it. So it's all based on whether you see this, whether you, you perceive the whole object as blue and black or white and gold depends on your assumptions about, uh, about lighting. So here, here's that phenomenon. So here's that, that dress. You can see it's blue and black. And then shining light on it washes out the blue, even to the point of seeing white, which leaves the black reading as gold. <clears throat> so you can see in this example, so that blue and black under this kind of lighting, right, the blue under this yellow lighting would read the same way as white would under this blue filter. See, then this yellow dress put under the blue filter light looks is the exact same shade as what we would be reading as black with a different lighting context. They're the same colors. So what you're reading is blue and black depends on what your the assumption you're making 
whether we see it as blue or black or white and gold depends on your assumption about the background lighting because it's like you're correcting for whatever this filter is that's around the object. Now here's here is another example that shows that um, color perception is contextual. So when this pair of pairs, this green is the same as this green. But you're probably seeing this green as brighter. And maybe that's because you're thinking of it as, as closer to you, or this looks like it's maybe a bit further away behind the bars. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but they are this, the exact same color green. Here's another example. How many, how many colors of balls are there? How many different colors of balls are there in that picture? Chloe's on to it. They're all kind of yellow, okay? They're all the same color. Like this color here is the same as that color there, is the same as that color there. But like probably many of you, it looks to me like this is a yellow ball. These three are yellow, that these three are kind of what, like orangey, um, and that these three over here are purpley. But that that sense of that color is created by the colors of the bars that are in front of it, okay? Notice that the colors of the bars kind of change. It looks like they go behind it sometimes or they go in front of it, and that affects your perception of the color. But there's only one, only one wavelength there. And this simplifies it. Okay, so in this picture, there are only three colors. There's the orange, the pink, and this kind of teal color. But it looks like blue when it's paired with the magenta stripes. And it looks like green when it's paired with the orange stripes. Right? The orange kind of brings out some kind of green and this purple seems to, to bring out a blue, but they're actually the same. Now, I'm, I'm gonna leave you on, on this note. What's going on there? This is um, called the scintillating grid illusion. When you look at it, you'll be aware of maybe I can see a, a, a white dot, but then the other ones are, are going going a little mad for me. They're they're coming in and out. And uh, the, the effect of, of this optical illusion is explained by a neural process called lateral inhibition. We're not going to talk about it in this class. It's this um this phenomenon has to do the, with the way that groups of receptors work together and excite or inhibit each other. But for now, I thought that would be a, um, a fun one to leave off on and, and maybe give you a, a desire for a taste for more. So if you want to learn more about this, there, there are upper level courses in perception that you can take. And that brings me to the end of this lecture. Oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> one more minute left. And so the last slide um, for this lecture is, is on blindness. And so, you know, it's, it's possible for folks to, to lose their vision or to be born without it. And what happens then is that there is a heightening of other senses. So the, the cortex isn't wasted. The, the visual cortex in blind people is allocated to um, other processing other senses. And so they can be much more sensitive to touch, um, to smell, um, to to hearing and I actually had um, a friend of mine is, is blind and she was quite upset by the sort of COVID masking because she had a medical exemption from wearing a mask, but people who saw her without a mask would go and like police her and tell her off, which was quite upsetting to her. But um, she said that wearing the mask really threw off her bat senses. Um, and I don't know if that meant echolocation or, or whether that meant her ability to smell, but she did find that the mask made it harder for her to, to navigate. Um, 
there are different kinds of, of blindness that aren't all about just not being able to to sense um, incoming light. It's also it's possible to have the sensory receptors working, but the perception part not working. So there's something called visual agnosia where people cannot identify an object by looking at it. So you can look at that and say, oh, it looks like like a pineapple. But um, if you had visual agnosia, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. But you would be able to identify it maybe by smelling it or by feeling it, right? By touch, by other senses, but not just by looking at it, even though your, your sensory receptors are, are working just fine. There's also another phenomenon called blind sight. And people with blind sight are not aware that they can see, yet if you were to have them walk down a hallway, they they would be able to navigate it, right? They would navigate around objects that apparently they can't see. And so what might be happening there is that um, there's some damage to the primary visual cortex, but maybe not to the secondary visual cortex, to the association cortex. All right. Um, that takes me to the end of the section on vision, and we'll pick up next lecture on to learn about hearing. I'll stop the recording here and be available for questions.